There's a group out there that hate dispensational salvations. They hate the teaching about dividing salvation, which was so important and so salient that helped many of you, especially those watching online, solving the fears and the worries when you read certain passages about losing salvation, how you had to do good works. But then when you learned about, no, dividing, rightly dividing salvation to the Christian church, which is different from the nation of Israel, which majority of those passages where it talks about faith and works is applied to the nation of Israel. And then it, you are worried and concerned, but then this doctrine dispensationalism has helped you. So anyone who has a question concerning about solving the contradiction with Romans chapter 4 and James 2, I would recommend for you to watch uh, my previous drawing that I just did, and I'll put a link below this video, okay? So if you watch that video, it will help solve the contradiction easily of Romans 4 and James 2, and you're going to go, wow, this is so helpful. So before you watch this teaching that I'm about to do right now, you should watch the previous drawing that I did, and I'll put the video link below. That way you can see why this is important to talk about, dispensational salvation. It'll help you. But there are people who have the audacity and the strangeness to hate dispensational salvation when it's supposed to save a lot of lives out there and even souls. So here's what they do. What they do is, is that with Romans chapter 4, it is very plain when you look at Romans chapter 4, Paul talked about faith not by works. And then it's very plain when you look at James chapter 2 that there is a faith that has to have works and works. So that's found at James chapter 2. So this idea we easily solve by what? It's called rightly dividing, which I talked to you. That's it. This is for Christians, simple. And this is for Jews in the tribulation, simple. And again, watch the previous drawing and the video link will be underneath. Now, this solves a contradiction and your fear and concern. It's so easy. But people hate dispensational salvation. I don't know why. So what they would do is that because they hate this idea of the verse saying that you have to have works as a part of your salvation. They hate that idea. So because they have that, what they will do is that they will not honestly let the verse read for itself, but they're going to insert their interpretation onto it. And when you come across that kind of person, it should put a red flag on you that are there really King James only? Because they're not reading the verse as it says, one. And are they really dispensationalist? Because they refuse to divide it. They refuse to divide the salvation. So that should concern you. So this is how they justify it, which is a very complicated argument. How they argue is that in James chapter 2, they argue that, well, this justification is before men. So this has nothing to do with your salvation. This is simply a justification before men that has nothing to do with your salvation. And this red ink gave up the ghost. Okay, I'll have to get a different red ink later on. So then, they call this a justification before men that has nothing to do with your salvation. And then Romans 4, this justification has to do with your salvation. And that's justification before God. Now look at these fancy kind of terms that they pull up, right? And you're like, where did they get that idea from, right? I know some of you are wondering that now. Like, okay, that's quite an interpretation. How are you going to prove that one has to do with salvation and the other one does not have to do with salvation? So this is their idea. So what they will do is that rather than just simply the word as it is, they want to try to define it for you, interpret it for you. So justified, what it means is to be declared righteous. That's the idea. So not all the time does it mean salvation. It only means declared righteous. It doesn't have to refer to salvation all the time. So the idea is this. How they interpret it is in James chapter 2, men, when they look at your works, you know, you're probably smoking, drinking, your works are bad. Then by looking at that, they can't declare you righteous. 
See, that's how they get around this passage that has nothing to do with salvation. It's just that in people's eyes, you don't look righteous. So look at James chapter 2, how they argue this. They will quote um, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So they're simply arguing right here, in man's eyes, your Christianity looks dead to you. So you look like a dead Christian. See, that's the idea. You have a dead faith. So it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's just simply, when I look at your Christian, uh, when I look at your Christian life, you look dead. So your faith is dead. That's how they argue. Then they word it right here, if you keep reading down, in verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. So notice right here, it's a man seeing. It's a man seeing. So in his eyes, you're not declared righteous. That's their idea. Whereas here, in Romans chapter 4, what is it? It's before God. So in God's eyes, you're declared righteous, hence it refers to salvation. That's how they get around it. So this passage has to do with salvation, and this one has nothing to do with salvation. Okay, now, the simple debunking to this argument is this. You can work like this with your interpretation, but here's the idea. You can work the interpretation the other way too, where you can say, this is referring to salvation. Now you might say, how so? Because here's the problem right here, okay? When you got saved in Jesus Christ, you were justified, correct? What does justified mean? You're declared righteous, right? Okay, so then when you get saved, weren't you declared righteous? Yeah, so then right here, just because you argue justified means to be declared righteous, how do you not know that refers to salvation then? Yeah, because when you all got saved, weren't you declared righteous? Yeah, you were all declared righteous. You were all justified, right? So how do we know this has to do, uh, this has to do with salvation or nothing to do with salvation? Well, it's before men. Well, that's not helpful because how do you not know that because before men, your works are very bad. That's why they're saying that you're a lost person. You're not saved. How do you not know that? Just because someone looks at your work and they look at you and then they're like, well, your work is not good. So because of that, I can't declare you a saved person. See that? So it could work either or. So how do you not know James was arguing for that? So you got to realize this. Interpretation could go either or. Yeah. Was well, justification before men? Well, that's not even helpful right there. Yeah. See, it doesn't help. So then, how are we going to argue this, these two cases right here? Okay, so the idea is this. So we have to look at the scriptures on which interpretation works. I'm not invalidating their interpretation right here, okay? You could work like this. But the problem is this. If you're going to be totally honest, you can switch a root with that too. You can switch a root with that and say it could be referring to salvation. Okay, so then we have to look at the verse and it will tell you if it has something to do with salvation or it has zero to do with salvation. Okay, so let's look at James chapter 2 again, okay? Look at verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. So James is saying, okay, so then you believe. All right, that's good. Thou doest well. Look at this part. The what? Devils also believe and tremble. If this has nothing to do with salvation, why would James put a serious point pointing out the lost condition of Satan and his minions here. Okay, so this has something serious to do with your salvation. Otherwise, James would not be pointing out the lost condition of the devil. It's not just Satan, he just lost his fellowship with Jesus Christ like a typical Christian, but he is eternally secured and going to heaven like we are. See, that doesn't work, right? That doesn't work. But here's a more obvious case right here. The more obvious case is... Well, before I give the more obvious case, let me go through a little bit more specific points. Look at verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is what? Dead. dead being alone. You notice how they worded this, right? Well, if you have a dead Christian faith, you know, when your works are that poor, that's why you're a dead Christian. But by wording like that, you can't step around where you're deliberately saying dead faith. Here's the idea. A Christian, when he is dead in his Christian life, it's his works that are dead, not his faith. You got to realize this. 
Paul and James, their issue with justification is living and dying by faith or by works. Because here's some examples. Let me explain right here. We're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Living and dying with justification had to do with salvation, whether you like it or not. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Look, Paul definitely did not believe in a dead faith. He did not believe in dead faith. There is no such term. So look what Paul argued right here. Paul argued right here that concerning this faith issue is that justification, so here's an argument that you've got to keep in mind. Justification, for, which has to do with salvation, obviously, has to do with living or dying by faith. Living or dying. And then the issue is what? The issue is faith. Or, if you have to have faith and works, that's the issue. Because look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, there you go with justification, right? Shall what? Live by faith. See that? Here's another one. Go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Here's another one. Notice right here that the issue Paul was pointing out is there are no works involved in this faith and that is enough for you to live by, by faith. He did not believe in this notion about a dead faith. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And then we'll read... I just lost my passage. Verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? Live. Yet not I, but who? Christ liveth in me. Look, it doesn't matter if uh, your Christian walk is dead. Yeah. When you have justification by faith and a Christ inside you, that's living. Amen. That's not a dead Christ. Amen. It's a living Christ. It's a living faith. And the what? Life, which I now live in the flesh. I live by the what? Faith of the Son of God. See that? Okay, another verse, which we won't turn to, but you can write it down. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. This proves that this issue is living or dying by faith. It does depend upon salvation. Salvation is the context here when it has to do with live or dying concerning faith. That is a big issue. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. A saved Christian does not have a dead faith. It's a living faith. This Christian, even though he's living by faith, his works may be very poor, right? You know what that means? What that means is his works are dead. It's poor. It's not his faith that's poor and dead. It's his works. Look at 1 Timothy, and then we'll look at chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is what? Dead. dead. So there is such a thing we believe in, in concerning a dead person. But what does that mean in context right here? It's concerning works. Notice right here, liveth in what? Pleasure is dead. It has to do with your work. Here's another one. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 1. Look at this. He is speaking to the church in Sardis and notice what he speaks to the church in Sardis. Their works are dead. That's what God's condemning them for. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest. See, by the name you're alive. Because we're saved by the name of Jesus Christ. Our names are in, written in the Lamb's book of life. But look at this. And art what? Dead. Why? Because of, I know thy what? Works. It's their works that are dead. So here's the idea here. You got to realize this. Christians, there is no such thing for us as a dead faith. That's invalid. Then you're saying you lost your salvation by faith. Our salvation by faith is not dead, friend. It's always living. 
the living Holy Spirit by faith will forever live inside you and it will never die. Remember, when you were lost in sin, what, ha what was your spiritual nature? It was dead, right? Yeah. yeah, we can't say that it's dead. It's alive. It's alive because it's by faith. But can their works be dead? Absolutely. So if you want to argue a dead Christian, James 2 is talking about a dead Christian, then what he should be saying right here is dead works. That's the idea. Now, if you say, no, uh, you Christians have a dead faith, you know, it's not alive. If you're going to argue that, then you're saying that the sacrifice and salvation by faith alone, without works, that it has such weak power. No, it will forever live. The doctrine of regeneration depends upon it. Justification for life depends upon it. Eternal life, eternal life is dependent upon faith. You're saying that our faith is also insufficient then. No, faith is enough. So there is no doubt James, when he's arguing right here, dead faith, the context has to do with salvation here. So whether you like to dance around this issue or not, if you're very honest, when you read the passage, it's pretty obvious that when you read James 2, it has to do with salvation right here. It has to do with salvation. Now, here's another thing how they would argue around it is that, well, before I cover that argument, one last thing I want to say is this, is that if you want to keep arguing that this James 2 has nothing to do with Romans 4 about the topic of salvation, it is so obvious when you read the context. Let's look at some examples, all right? When you look at the word justified by faith, that term, what is it found in the Bible, justified by faith? It has to do with the context of salvation, right? Paul said that word for word at Romans 4. James said that word for word at Romans 4. Now, do you think they were talking about different topics then when they were using the same words? Here's another thing. Romans 4 mentioned about Abraham right here. James chapter 2 mentioned about Abraham right here. You honestly think, James and Paul, that they were t in totally different worlds and talking about different topics then? No, they were talking about the same topic right here. Yeah. The issue was salvation concerning faith and works. Here's another thing right here. Another thing is, it is so obvious when you look at the wording and the context of the passage, why did Paul mention about Abraham when he believed the stars, he was imputed righteousness, and James repeated that passage? Don't you think they both, they had the same topic in mind? Or do you honestly think they were going in totally different la-la lands right here? You know who goes into totally different la-la lands? A totally biased dishonest person, not seeing the similarity with Romans 4 and 2, but trying to make, no, they were in totally different topics, totally different distinctions. Well, if you're going to be very honest, okay, very honest, without salvation by faith alone, salvation by faith and works, if you are a first-time Bible reader and you read Romans 4 and James 2, wouldn't you honestly think it's talking about the same topic right here? Yeah. yeah. That's an honest Bible reader, not a biased Bible reader. Yeah. See that? That proves that we're King James only because we're honestly reading the word as it says, word for word and context. Amen. Another thing is that proves that we are dispensationalists because we're not afraid to divide it. We divide it by saying that this is focused with Jews in the tribulation, whereas here is for Christians in the church. Again, look at my previous teaching. You can click on the link below if you don't even believe in that. It was that simple. So if a person claims to be dispensationalist in King James only, and then they're trying to mash potato, all of this, and then trying to say, well, you know, what it's talking about right here is, uh, has nothing to do with salvation. When they're trying to do that, then that should scare you that they that they're afraid to read it as it says, and they're afraid to divide that salvation. That should scare you. That should scare you. One last thing that they want to pull up is Romans 4. So which is their favorite passage that they're going to use? So let's go back to Romans 4. This is their favorite catchphrase. Notice in verse 2, Romans 4, verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. This is their line of defense. Romans 4, 2, they're going to... Com they're going to complain that this is an absolutist passage. That's what they're going to argue. It has nothing to do with a different time period where Abraham got this and got that later, blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's a matter-of-fact absolute statement. 
Abraham was never justified by works. That's what they're going to argue. But here's the simple argument to that. If they want to argue absolutist statement on that one, for Romans chapter 4, verse 2, you should be very honest then in giving an absolute statement as well for James chapter 2 and verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? You're going to have to make that absolutist too. Don't pick which passage you like better to support your salvation teaching and choose that to be absolutist. You know what our answer is? Both of them are real, actual statements. See, we'll take the, both the verse honestly as it is. It's so simple, though. You just divide it. Paul showed you the time period. It was when he believed in the stars. James told you the time period. It was when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar. It's that simple. But here's another boo-boo that they make. Another boo-boo that they make is in verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, look at this part. He hath whereof to glory. So he can glorify his justification by works. It's just not before who? God. So this is what they argue here. So right here, this is a justification before God. But right here, it's a just, but Paul's recognizing there's a justification before men. That's a big boo-boo. Yeah. In the Old Testament, you, when men judged you to be justified or not justified, that had to do depending upon your works and your salvation. Look at the book of Kings. huh? Look at the book of Kings. They just made a boo-boo now. They just fell into their own trap. We're going to look at the book of 2 Kings, please. 2 Kings, and then we'll look at chapter 8. Or 1 Kings, excuse me. 1 Kings, chapter 8, please. We're going to look at 1 Kings, and then we're going to look at chapter 8, verse 32. 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 32. This is how they argue. How they're going to argue is, but you know, no one in the Old Testament was justified before God, not even Abraham. Well, that's a big boo-boo you made right there. You just proved there's a different salvation in the Old Testament compared to New Testament. How so? Because what you confessed right here is this. Because this is what we teach and believe. Okay, hopefully that stand won't fall. All right. It's doing that thing again. <laughs> okay, so then how we argue right here, let's erase some parts right here. That way we don't, that way we can get a fuller picture. In the Old Testament, they had a different salvation, right? And then I mentioned a little bit of that in my previous drawing. Again, just watch the previous video if you don't understand, okay? I don't have to repeat. Uh, let's just do two right here. The Old Testament, there are verses that seem to show faith and works for salvation, which worries people. And then the Christian church, it seems to show faith and works, uh, faith alone, not by works. And that worries people. That's not to us. We just rightly divide it. The church has faith not by works. Old Testament Jews, their salvation was faith and works. It's that simple. So here's the thing, is that if you're a Jew in the Old Testament, when you're saved by faith and works, do you immediately go up to heaven? No. You know why? Because in God's eyes, you're not clean. See that? You're not justified. You need to wait for his payment, and then after that, the Old Testament saints, after Jesus died on the cross, they went up. Well, where did they go then? That's why this proves dispensationalism. They went to a place called Abraham's bosom here, which is located in hell. And in hell, that's where all sin goes, right? So they had a place of comfort there, whereas the lost people, they had a place of torment in hell. But these people had a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom. So in God's eyes, obviously, he's like, nope, you can't go to heaven because in my eyes... You're unclean. So what I'm going to do then is that I'm going to have to have men look at you on your works and depending on how they, and by man's righteousness, not my standard of righteousness, but on man's standard of works and righteousness, you're going to have to be judged that way and go down here. See, that was their salvation. That makes a lot of sense why... The Old Testament saints had to wait after Jesus died. Then they can get out and go up because now God's righteousness is right there. 
because use your head right here. If you want to argue that they were saved by faith alone, then you didn't have Jesus' death on the cross. So they don't have God's righteousness, his standard. And if you reject works, then you don't have man's righteousness and standard. Then what are they going to do? See that? So sin has to be punished and judged. So what did God do? He understood that. That's why he put them here in a temporary basis by man's standard of righteousness. Because he has to judge sin. Whether you like it or not, he has to judge sin. But he can't be so cruel just to send them to hell because Jesus didn't die yet. So what did he do? He went by man's standard of righteousness. See, that's why when you argue justification before men, justification before men, that just proves Old Testament salvation. They had to go by man's standard of righteousness. Man's works for their salvation. That's why it makes sense. Paul said later on, that we're not saved by man's works. We're saved by what Jesus did on the cross. But remember, you got, look, church age history is only 2,000 years. This whole time period is twice the times of that. What are you going to do with all of that? So this is understandable. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 32. Then hear thou in heaven and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked. Look at that. See, the wicked. Remember what Psalm says? The wicked shall be turned into hell, right? So the wicked people go to hell to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous, but by whose standards? To give him according to whose righteousness? Is it God's righteousness or his righteousness? See, his righteousness. See, this justification before men only pr proved our point on dispensational salvation right here. They had to go by man's standard of righteousness that time. That's why, don't you think it makes a lot of sense that if they were going by fleshy standards, fleshy standard of righteousness that time, and that's why it makes sense Paul called the law of Moses the law of the flesh many times, don't you see all of this? And their, whatever their flesh did outwardly, God counted that as their salvation. The Jews are a fleshy, physical people. And notice all of that distinguished, different from the church, who is a spiritual nation. Our salvation is not by our fleshy deeds and efforts, but by the spiritual work of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. The Holy Spirit... Uh, being born again within us, you see this? Doesn't this make a lot more sense now? A lot of things are clicking here. A lot of things are clicking here. They just only proved Old Testament salvation is different from New Testament salvation. That's what they did. Now, one of the ways that they would get around this argument, which is pretty weak, is, well, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 32 had nothing to do with salvation right here. <laughs> it had to do just with, you know, a saved person who lived wickedly, and then if he lived wickedly, God would kill him physically. And then if you're a saved person who lived righteously, then you know what happens? Then you get to live. So this has nothing to do with salvation. It just has to do with physical, earthly life and death by your works. That's how they get around it. But look, this is the simple debunking to it. Look up the words righteous and wicked in the Old Testament. Who is the wicked? Who is the righteous? And you will find out in Old Testament passages especially passages that have to do with salvation, it depended on your way of living, your works. Look up the words righteous and wicked, and the majority of the times it will show you it has to do with people who do works of righteousness for salvation. Amen. Wicked people, has to, uh, their life of wickedness costed them their soul in hell. Look up every verse in the Bible that talks about righteous and wicked, and majority of the time, you'll, you can't escape that fact. What God considers as righteous people and wicked people, he considers that as lost people and saved people. You'll see that throughout the Old Testament. And it depended on their works. You're going to notice that. 